when we talk about, um, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt in an environment where, um, you know, conferencing is new to some people, um, when customers, when you start to talk to them about security in relation to conferencing, the first thing they ask is, can a fraudster hear my meeting? Um, obviously, people treat their conference calls as proprietary information, um, unless, of course, it's a public forum, and they're very nervous about who can hear what's going on in their meeting. Um, they also worry about people being able to see the content. So today you joined this meeting. I'm sharing a presentation. This presentation is geared towards people that are involved in the CFCA or helping to stop uh, fraudulent activities. And um, what I think is really key is that, you know, we wouldn't want the content to fall in the hands of someone else. And, and customers are also concerned about that. <laughs> and the third one, uh, which, which we do hear frequently is, well, if fraud happens or if, if my meeting's compromised and my host never attended the meeting, am I going to pay for it? So we're going to address some of the concerns um, from a customer standpoint. Now, from a provider standpoint, um, our questions are a little bit different, right? Um, so our questions revolve around, you know, was the fraud participant in while customers were in attendance? Did the host see the fraudster? And I put see in air quotes, we'll talk about that. Did the um, product the host used, so obviously there's different products for unified communications, um, allow host rights to transfer once the host is connected? And we'll talk about that. And of course, did they make international revenue share fraud or high cost domestic calls post the host leaving? Sounds like a lot, don't worry, I'm gonna dive into it. So fear, I'm a customer, can someone hear my meeting? So the quick answer is, if the fraudster joins a live meeting and has audio connected, yeah, they can hear your meeting. Um, but in 85% of the meetings that we've seen, the fraudster usually joins only a web connection and waits to see if they're removed from the meeting. If they're not, they wait until valid participants disconnect. So that's kind of key, right? Um, until you can actually look at the meeting and what's happening, um, to be able to answer the question, you know, can someone hear my meeting that wasn't invited to my meeting? The answer is it depends, okay? Can someone see the content I'm sharing in my meeting it? Now, the quick answer is if the fraudster joins a live meeting, a meeting that's running and is live, um, via web join, and they're admitted into the meeting, then yeah, they can see what's being shared. Hopefully you're all seeing what I'm sharing and all the dings that I'm hearing have nothing to do with you guys not being able to see that. <laughs> and then will I pay for a meeting my host never attended? And again, this goes down to your service provider, right? Um, in, in the world of those of us that protect meetings, um, a meeting should never start without a host present, but We'll talk more about that. Okay, fears for providers. Covered this in the beginning a little bit. Was the fraud participant in while customers were in attendance? Normally, yes. We'll have to see how long the overlap was for, as that'll be a question from the customer that we'll have to answer. So did the fraudster get into a meeting and, and while the, the customer was having a, an event? Did the host see the fraudster? If the host was on the same web interface as the fraudster, then probably yeah. But we have seen where the fraudster hides by naming their line, like naming it the name of the host or an employee at the company or something else, so that they hide in that participation list. Did the product the host use allow host rights to transfer once the host got disconnected? So we all end our meetings, right? Meetings eventually end. What happens after it ends? Most people think, well, if I'm the host, hang up, meeting hangs up. Well, it's not always the case. It really depends on, on the specific product that you're using. Um, but we've seen that uh, when a host does disconnect, there are certain UC platforms that allow the meeting to stay live. And the, um, the background on that is historically, um, before cell phones were as reliable as they are today, if uh, a host was connected via a mobile phone and went through a dark spot or a, a place that the phone got disconnected, People didn't want the meeting to automatically end. So a lot of things were built into unified communications to keep that meeting alive under the good pretense that the host would join again, would join back. Um, but in some cases, we found that, that this 
usability has been exploited for fraud. And the last thing the providers usually ask was, well, what happened, right? Did they, did, what, what was the fraudster doing? What did they want to get done? Um, and a lot of times uh, their ultimate goal is to make international revenue share fraud, we'll talk about that, um, or high cost domestic calls post the host leaving the meeting. So my first question to the group would be like, hey, how do fraudsters know what meetings to attend? Okay, well, the, fir the first thing is people do a really great job publicizing their public events, right? <laughs> That's, we have whole marketing departments around publicizing events. Um, we have a lot of people that, uh, you know, created the world of the reoccurring meeting. Um, team stand up every morning at 9 a.m., um, you know, weekly team roundup, uh, quarterly review um, that happen at the same time, at the same, on the same date, either every day, every week, every month. Those reoccurring meetings, the fraudsters figure out that, that attendance pattern. Meetings posted with no password to join. So I make a reference to COVID-19 here um, because this became very popular. Um, for those of you that don't know, in my, in my spare time, uh, while I've been in the telecom industry for 20 years, I, I did own a gym and I made a lot of friends in the fitness industry. And you would be surprised how many people put out there um, once everybody kind of was, was forced into lockdown because of COVID-19, you know, hey, come join my workout class. Here's the link, no password, no nothing. And the link is always available. So even though they said, hey, join my link at 9 a.m., there's no password on the meeting. So if you join their link at 11 a.m., you are in a meeting. Um, so we saw a lot do during COVID-19 of the, the popularity of posting that, that meetings don't have passwords. Um, and then of course we have uh, landing pages um, for certain uh, platforms within the uh, unified communication space where you would be able to enter in a meeting ID that you want to join. So you don't have the actual invite or the link. There are landing pages you can enter in the meeting ID. Um, and we found that number generators can hit up on those pages and try to guess um, the same. Okay, so interesting. So we talked a little bit about public events. So here goes my analogy. You're going to hear it um, where I'm taking your conference rooms and comparing it to your home. So putting your information out there about an event that could require or not require registration. Your message clearly says, international participants welcome, okay? This is just like putting your address out on social media, like a Facebook, with a picture of your house, and then also including a picture of all your valuables inside your house, right? And you may giggle and go, oh, that's extreme, but it's very similar, right? You're saying, here's where I live, here's what my house looks like, and here's everything that's inside come on in. Um, and that's what you're doing when you're talking about putting an event out there um, that may or may not require registration. We talk about reoccurring meetings. I did cover this before. Putting information out about an event that's every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and it'll be 30 minutes of intense fun and learning. Um, we've all seen those <laughs> marketing spins. And um, that's very similar to putting your address out in social media and telling people, in the post above that, so not the actual post with your address, but the one above that, you say, I'm so excited, I'm going on vacation for the next five days. And then the post after that, you post a picture of you at the airport with a little line that says, ready to take off, right? You're pretty much saying, hey, here's my house, I'm not home, and look, I'm actually at the airport. Very similar to posting the explicit details of how long your meeting is going to be and when it's going to take place with or without security on the meeting. So meetings posted without password. So um, this is putting information about an event and stating there's no password to join. So easy to join. Um, this is like putting your address out in social media with your front door open and a comment that says, I'm gone for three days and I forgot to shut my front door. Um, okay, you guys are getting the analogy here, right? Like you know where it's going. Um, basically by saying there's no password on your conference meeting, you're leaving your door wide open. Random number generator. Um, so this one was a little bit of a stretch uh, with my analogy, but I tried. So let's say you want an easy to remember password or meeting number. So what better way than ask your service provider to provision it sequentially? Um, this way you can guess the meeting number. Fraudsters can too, right? So this is like buying a home and not changing the locks on your door or the code to the garage. Um, 
So remember, some real estate agents, when they list a home, they list the garage codes in the listing, um, and you should probably change them up upon purchasing that home. If you don't, that's kind of like the random number generator. And I did tell you guys before the slide that this was a little bit of a reach for my analogy, but I tried. <clears throat> so the goals of most fraudsters, I want to commit international revenue share fraud. Okay, so I put in here a definition from GM GMSA of IRSF, where it's a form of fraud where the perpetrator artificially inflates traffic by generating calls to certain portions of international member ranges with no intention to pay for the calls. So we all understand that IRSF targeted conferencing platforms and customers PBXs, that's not new. And the goal of the fraudster is to, is to make as many dial outs to high cost revenue share numbers as they could before they get caught. People say, why? Well, somebody's making money off that call. And in some cases, the person that's physically on the, the conferencing platform making those calls was hired by someone to make those calls. They're not actually the person collecting the check. Um, there's been some you know, research done in that sector to find out are the people who are making the calls, the people who are profiting the calls. Usually there's a, a, a higher event um, in there where you actually hire someone to do uh, this illegal activity. So of course I'm gonna say, here's what's needed for security. And this is basic, basic security in, in the conference space. So number one, meetings can't happen without a host. And I will tell you that from a customer support standpoint, this is probably the one that we get the most pushback from. Um, it, it, you know, you talk to customers and you say, you know, you really need to make it that a, that a host joins. So today, Sarah started our meeting. And if Sarah didn't join, Sarah overslept, Sarah, you know, took a long lunch, um, she wouldn't have started the meeting and then the meeting wouldn't have taken place. And people view that as, as a poor experience. So we, we want meetings to happen without a host. And, you know, Jamie's the presenter. So if Jamie joined, but Sarah didn't, we'd want the meeting to go on. Um, you know, it, each product has their own solution to that scenario. And, and it's really important to discuss with, um, with customers or within your meetings to make accommodations for that. So for instance, for most of my meetings, I always have a, a co-host. Um, if something were to happen or a co-moderator or I give my presenter host rights um, so that if somebody does join uh, my meeting, depending on the platform, uh, the meeting will be able to happen if, if something happens to me and I'm not able to join. The next one is that the host controls do not pass. You might say, well, what? So there are certain features on certain platforms that only a host can do. And you wanna make sure that those features don't actually pass to someone else unless the host wants them to, right? So the host has to be in that meeting and say, I'm going to give host privileges to this person, okay? <clears throat> the third one talks about public calendars um, and, and, and events being listed. And we say, oh, don't do public calendars. And uh, the educational vertical, the, the educational sector of the world gets, gets very concerned over this because, you know, a lot of people get a lot of attention by having public meetings, um, but putting out a full calendar of all the meetings that are happening allows that disclosure of those reoccurring meetings or static meetings, I like to call them. Um, we also talk about you know, events where you're having a, a good number of people, should be registration only. Um, they should take place on a platform that only allows the event to start 15 minutes before the scheduled meeting and extend 15 minutes after end time. Again, we get a lot of feedback here to say, well, I booked my meeting for an hour, but it might go an hour and a half and I don't want the meeting to drop. And I think that's where you really need to understand the platform to find out how you could extend that meeting if need be. And then the host should always audit who is in their call. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna talk about in another slide is especially people that are in your meeting twice. So we hear this a lot where people are like, I don't, I'm not connected twice, but I see my name on there twice. Um, we'll kind of go over what that, what that could mean. So, um, so that's like the basics. So this is what the security professionals want you to have. And this is where you get out your pen and paper and go, oh, here's the secret sauce. No, um, the, the first are pretty much exactly the same as the basics. Um, except we, we do a list here. Item number five starts with a little bit different. Um, we say that the host should admit the participants into the call manually. And depending about like the size of the meeting is whether or not this is attainable. If you're expecting 20 to 25 people, then the host can say, okay, I, I see who's here. If you have 200 people, it's gonna be a little tough. 
um, to put them in manually. We also say lock the meeting after 15 minutes. So you guys saw, you know, Sarah started the meeting. She passed it over to me. I haven't looked at the attendee list since I started presenting. So we want to make sure that additional people didn't join the meeting unless Sarah, as the host, was able to, to decide whether or not they should or shouldn't be in the meeting. Um, number seven, I, I've seen a lot of jokes um, out in the social media environment about <laughs> join tones, um, but we do say to keep join tones on, especially if it's a highly confidential meeting, you're going to want to hear when people are joining, not necessarily leaving, um, but definitely on, on join. We also say that uh, when there's an integration between an audio conference call and a web platform, that you limit the um, where, where that platform is able to call out to. So a lot of platforms today say, you know, call me. And if you're on a platform that only allows computer audio, then that's very different. We're talking here on platforms that allow not just computer, computer audio, but actually let the call go out to the PSTN. And I think it's really key that you understand how calls can route um, in a unified communication environment and how you could limit exposure uh, to calls going out over the PSTN for um, high cost country areas. And the last one is one of my favorites, which is um, if there's only a web join to your conference call, it's one participant, they're hanging out, um, that you would tear down that call. Um, you know, a, a conference call in general is two people. So having a conference call that's sitting there with one person for an hour um, seems kind of silly. Uh, so tear that down automatically. Have the platform tear it down, not the individual person. So, you know, which home is yours? Are you out there posting open house, right? Here I am, I'm at the airport, go on, use my conference room. Um, are you the second where, you know, your, your home is closed, locked, you know, locked down? Or are you the third, um, which is pretty much my house where you have a giant gate in front? Um, it's not my house, it's not a picture of my house at all. Um, but <laughs> that you have a giant gate in front, um, your windows are boarded up, your doors are boarded up. You know, which extreme are you from a, a how to keep your conference uh, room protected. Um, most of us are going to fall in the middle, but some of you might have, you know, thought about some of your past meetings and said, ooh, that meeting kind of fell in this open house environment. And we just wanted to educate today kind of what's going on in that sector, especially with the high use of, of conferencing platforms. So um, I encourage you to talk with, um, you know, wh whomever your company uses for, for conferencing. Um, really evaluate the type of meeting and the service and find out what other security enhancements might be available based on, you know, obviously keeping fraudsters from making IRSF calls, but also for your customers' purposes, um, protecting uh, their data and their information. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing.